Hello friends, Dr. David Katz, another COVID reality check. This one on reinfection and self-defense. And, and what links these two topics together is helplessness. In the psychology literature, there's probably nothing more toxic for our psychological well-being than helplessness. A lot of adversity, a lot of challenges can inspire and motivate us, but of course helplessness makes us feel like there's nothing to be done, and so we just capitulate. And the pandemic, because it's, it's so big and so much of its management depends on things we don't control, can make us feel helpless. And I suspect we've all suffered with that to some extent. We are not helpless. We actually have a tremendous capacity to manage our risk for adverse outcomes from this virus. So I will return to that before I wrap up. But first, quickly, reinfection. There has now been one confirmed case of reinfection with SARS-CoV-2. The fact that there is just one confirmed case is really important because there's been speculation about reinfection for months. In fact, I wrote a column reacting to all that speculation several months ago. I'll attach that along with other resources uh, at the bottom of the video. Uh, but there is just one confirmed case, and everything about it seems to me good news, not bad. It's a 33-year-old man from Hong Kong. He had the infection four and a half months ago in Hong Kong and wasn't very sick. He was hospitalized because it was required by law in Hong Kong as part of their quarantine procedure. He made a full recovery. Four and a half months later, he was traveling the world, and he had a routine test for COVID, not because he had any symptoms at all, at an airport in Spain after leaving the UK, and he was found to be infected again with a different strain of the coronavirus that was now circulating in Europe. So again, four and a half months after getting one strain of this virus in Asia, he had a different strain in Europe. And the first time he had very mild symptoms, and the second time he had no symptoms at all. And uh, apparently has now recovered completely from his second infection with no symptoms at all. What that suggests is he had immunity from his first infection that made the second infection even milder. That's particularly impressive given that he never made antibodies after the first infection. And he never made antibodies because the infection was so mild. We have a volume of evidence now suggesting that a more severe bout of COVID results in the antibodies we measure, IgM and IgG, whereas a mild bout of this infection is fought off more superficially with memory T cells, with IgA, secretory IgA, a different kind of antibody that's, if you will, more superficial. And we don't measure that routinely. We, we measure the, the deeper antibodies, uh, IgM and IgG. He didn't have those. So he had a fairly tepid immune response the first time around because he had such a mild infection. And even that was enough, four and a half months later, to make his infection even milder with a different strain of the virus. There is no bad news in that mix. All immunity wanes with time. You can get any infection a second time, chicken pox, measles, if enough time goes by, if your immune system weakens. And we've all heard the term booster, booster vaccine, and every vaccine that, that comes with a booster is an illustration of the importance of refortifying the immune system after some amount of time has gone by because that's what boosters do. They basically remind your immune system, hey, you, you saw this protein, you saw this pathogen some number of years ago, but you barely remember it. Let, let's, let's remind you so that if you encounter it, you're prepared to defend against it. That's just normal. That's how immunity works. It's most robust in the immediate term after an infection. It's more robust if the infection is severe. It's less robust if the infection is mild, and it's less robust with the passage of time. And, of course, it's more likely that an enemy can, can pass the gate if it doesn't look exactly like the enemy that was seen before, and two different strains of SARS-CoV-2 look a bit different. All good news. So reinfection is rare. Different strains of the virus can cause it, and there's been all sorts of speculation. Maybe a second bout would be worse than the first because the immune system would have an amplified response. Well, we could continue to speculate, but so far the evidence comes down to an N of 1, and everything about the N of 1 is good news. Okay, that, that's the reinfection story. I wrote a column about it with a little bit more. I will append that as well. 
And then on the issue of self-defense, we are not helpless. Obviously, we can all take matters into our own hands in terms of reducing our likelihood of getting exposed. That's especially important if you are in a highly vulnerable group, social distancing, use of masks. And it's highly important for all of us to avoid any potential transmission to someone who is in a high-risk group. And that would be anybody over 70, especially anybody over 80. My parents are 80. They're in generally good health, but we're very careful with them. If we've had no potential exposure for at least two weeks and we're completely asymptomatic, we go back to hugging. On the other hand, if there's any possibility that we might have been exposed and two weeks have not gone by, we socially distance. Uh, we're very careful with them, and I'd recommend similar practices in your families. But in terms of our personal risk, we can't do anything about our age. But otherwise, risks for bad COVID outcomes are all modifiable. They're basically measures of cardiometabolic health. So the short list of things that put us at increased risk for bad outcomes are obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, increased inflammation, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, coronary disease. Now, if you have type 2 diabetes or hypertension or coronary disease, you can't make it go away instantaneously. But there's good news even there. There's research out of both China and the United States showing that if you simply improve your blood pressure control, and in particular if you improve your glycemic control, so you have diabetes but you go from poorly controlled uh, blood sugar levels to well-controlled blood sugar levels, you can reduce your risk of bad COVID outcomes, hospitalization, ICU, death, by a factor of four. That, that's huge. So four times lower risk of hospitalization because you've improved your glycohemoglobin. Now this can be done with medication, but it's even more powerful to do it with lifestyle. And so that's where you have the greatest opportunity to practice self-defense. Improve your diet, improve your activity pattern, improve your weight, reduce your inflammation, all of that. And the benefits can begin with a single meal or a single walk. Once again, volumes of evidence showing that one good meal versus one bad changes blood flow, something called endothelial function alters immune system responses, something called chemotaxis. Same is true for one bout of moderate physical activity versus spending that same amount of time on the couch. Of course, you don't get the full measure of benefit with just one meal or just one walk. The benefit accumulates over time, but the benefit begins with one well-put-together, well-chosen meal, one bout of moderate physical activity, and, and that tells you that it's never too late to begin practicing self-defense against bad COVID outcomes. It's certainly never too early. Uh, so I highly recommend that. You are not helpless. And, and uh, the links that I will attach will lead you to a COVID risk calculator so you can potentially get a handle on your personal risk, get some information about the things you can do to attenuate that risk, share that with the people you love. So good news all around from my point of view. Reinfection, rare and in accord with our hopes and expectations. The immune system remembers this virus, is prepared to fight it a second time around, and based on the one case we have so far confirmed, a second infection is milder than the first, and it's likely that if the first infection was severe, immunity is more robust, will last longer, and the, the likelihood of, of secondary infection is probably much less. And for those of us who are not worried about reinfection so much as what happens if we encounter this bug, there's a lot we can do to take matters into our own hands, attenuate our risk, practice self-defense. We are not helpless. That's today's message. Stay well.